Okay. So, let's start. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for attending this session. It's a pleasure to be here in person in Prague with you. After all, such a long time to know uh, known faces and to discover new people. So, just a little background about me before to start. So, I used to be a civil engineer working in a big international telecommunication companies where I gained some uh, project manager experience. And then I started in Parallel in 2006, a software development. And we discovered Drupal with my friend Nicola on the picture also. Um, back in 2007, I was then a freelance backend developer. And one of the best things that happened in my uh, professional career was to, to be fired actually, and uh, to, to gain full time to, to do what I love, meaning software developer and Drupal. And our first DrupalCon was in 2013 in Amsterdam, and we also discovered the community, and we really liked it. So that was a chance, and we then started our own company, which is called Webstance. We are located in Belgium, in Moos, in the south part of Belgium. So we are now growing with a fantastic team of 22 people. This also means that since the last two or three years, I had less time to do real uh, back-end development but I had to focus on the management of the company. And because we like the community, it also means that we like to, to contribute and to give back, and this is also the philosophy of this talk today, to share some, some experience building an ambitious Drupal project over the last uh, few years. So the title for this uh, talk is Mind the Last 20%, because while we were building this ambitious website, we come to the same situation over and over, that the first 80% of the project are running quite smoothly, seamlessly. We see good progress. We are really convinced that we reach everything on time. We even accept some change requests from the customer. And then, all of a sudden, we don't really know what happens, but to cover the last 20% takes more time than expected. And we see some overruns in budget or in timing. So may I first ask, uh, in the audience, who is familiar with this situation? Can you please raise your hands? Okay, so it's quite reassuring. So we also wanted to check if this was something inherent to our company, to Drupal or to others. So we also did a small survey in our network and we collected about 20 answers. So the people who answered the survey, they have about 70 years of experience in software development. They have profiled like CEO, CTO, project manager, founders, lead dev, biz dev. 80% of them, they are doing Drupal. And for the people who are not doing Drupal, they're doing either WordPress, Angular, Node.js, Ember, Java, etc. So we have small companies and bigger companies, on the average 42 employees. And the first trend is that already more than 90% are familiar with this situation. But the good news is that two thirds of the people they are not surprised anymore. So if you have experience, you get used to it. So today I would like to go over five different causes for hoverance. And for each of these, I would like to explain a bit what we're talking about, to give some hints or tips from our experience, and then to enrich the topic with advices from the survey. So the first group of causes is the misalignment between the customer and the agency. And you won't be surprised that everything is communication and setting the right expectations since the beginning. It can be a problem if your customer is not, not also not involved uh, completely during the project. For instance, we see sometimes customers that are not available until the end of the project when they see some concrete deliverables that are ready to be tested. And this can jeopardize your project. Also, of course, if they come with late approvals, late provision of content, this becomes more difficult to finish, of course, in time and if we budget. So what we are doing to cope with that is we are trying to be very clear from the beginning of the project, explaining what will be the different phases of a digital project. So you may know this picture from the internet. Not all of our customers are really always digitally mature, so we, they have to learn also during the project. And you have to, to tell them what you expect from them, at which phase, what kind of content. 
when do they need to be more involved or less involved? So everything is, is communication. Also to align, of course, we are doing kickoff meetings, but it's also very good to, to keep the alignments during the project. So we organize uh, steering committee meetings every three or four weeks. Eventually, if you know that the customer won't be available during the project, but they have more time at the end of the project, it's not a bad idea to also foresee more time and resources at the very end of the project to, to cope with this feedback. So from the survey, we asked the people, do you think there is a first time effect? So that it's more difficult when you start working with a project uh, with your customer for the first time. And the answer is clearly yes. More than 90% of the people do believe that there is a first time effect and that goes better with time. So that's a good news. But maybe the lesson from this is maybe that we should try to limit the scope of the first project with customers. So that we learn to know each other better. Also some other advice we collected from the survey. We should not underestimate the time that is needed by the customer to, to provide inputs, even if these are simple inputs that you are used to, to get. Maybe that's not so easy for the customers. We should clearly agree on the definition of done. What does that mean? Are we aligned on what you are expecting? We should invest in prototyping. So we use, clearly we use Figma for this, but there are also other tools. It's very good to, to show it concretely what it will look like. And also another advice is to deliver something on paper, which is very clear on, on your assumption uh, of what you're going to do. For the second group of causes, this is about specification, and you can have an incomplete scope, an over details specification, or how do you handle uh, change management? So when we go over over detail specification, well, I think you've all seen that we receive a request for proposal, and it looks more like a Christmas wish list than really uh, an explanation about the business needs of the customer. So uh, there it's very important to, to discuss and to align with the customer to tell him that we are doing tailor-made software development and we are not delivering industrial products. So they have to understand the impact of each and every request that is in their document and we have to, to manage that and to answer. Also, some of the customers sometimes they, they just try even to, to detail too much up to the technical solution that you have to implement and that's also an issue when you have to, to, to tell him what you need is more the business needs and not what you are supposed to do. That's more the role of the solution architect. When the scope is incomplete, what we try to do, um, so it can be incomplete but because the customer just don't know uh, what he has to specify. So what we try to do is to allocate a bit more time for analysis at the beginning of the project. In this case, this presentation should have been called Mind the First 10 Person because in the end, uh, everything has to be clearly specified from the, f from the start. Finally, uh, we have to, what we propose also is to learn from project to project. And um, for instance, there are some features that are common and are coming back in every project. So what, what you are doing is you are going, trying to build some templates for specification, asking the same questions to, to the customer from one project to the other. So for instance, for forms, we may ask them what are the fields that are required? Should the answers be sent to third party services? Uh, do we have to go to a thank you page or to send an email, things like that. You can save a lot of time doing this. So from the survey, people also noticed that the, the business requirements are sometimes expressed differently when the user really start testing. So you have to cope to that and be able to, to change and to adapt. Also, people remind us that we are doing estimates. We are in a competitive market and estimates are difficult. So what we encourage you to do is to do the job after the project is finished to compare your initial estimates with the time that you have really spent. You are not always doing this, but it's on from my point of view, that's the only way to learn and to do better estimates in the future. Also, that's not easy, of course, but um, they advise us to not come back on the decision on the scope without having a formal change request. That's not an easy one, but uh, we should sometimes try to be more strict on that. Okay, so the third group of causes is the pressure. So at the end of the project, we often see pressure from the customer or the different stakeholders. It can also be internal pressure, for instance, from 
managers or, or even from colleagues. And what we tend to do is to allocate more resources at the end of the project, which also means that you burn your budget faster than expected. So to cope with that, what we have done internally, we have built dynamic dashboards that are connected directly to the timesheets of the developers so that we can see directly in real time the, the budget that is spent. Of course, it requires that developers are completing their timesheets and the level of advancement with quite some accuracy. But this gives the ability to project manager to give early visibility to the customer about the status and the, the, the progress of the project. Uh, also, what we are doing is um, to, to ease the, the, the final steps of the project. We used to build some checklists for the go-life, the usual suspects, the things you have to do always for each and every project. For instance, a SEO checklist, infrastructure, or configuration of the website. So we can go a bit faster and be sure we don't forget any of these details. Finally, we also advise, do not an easy one, but don't give in to the customer pressure. Someone told me a spoiled customer is a lost customer. So in the end, it's true. If you always say yes to each and every demand, sooner or later you will lose the customer because you will come to some point where you, you cannot say yes anymore. So from the survey, people also tell you that you should uh, evaluate the risk in real time and be transparent with your end customer about that and, and share the risk. That's very important. You should accept uncertainty and imperfection, and we completely agree with that. We are not perfect, so we should, we should tell that to the customer from the start, that we are not perfect and that there will be difficulties. But instead of being perfect, we are flexible and we are responsive, and we are ready to, to be really there when we need it, to, uh, for, for as they said, for instance, uh, to respond to drifts and uh, to the implication. Finally, we try also to learn and to optimize for the future, and that's also what, what we are doing now. The fourth group is the, the details and the finishing touches. So that's one of the problems that some of the things may, s may look very simple, but in the end, for instance, if I take the example of just uh, user registration or login, there are many different ways to do that. And if you go into the details, you can spend quite some time there are a lot of uh, exceptions or special cases, and that, that takes time. They are unpredictable, and this is often difficult to anticipate. So you should try to give more visibility with the details to the customer. And to do that, of course, we try to use some tools for the prototyping, like Figma. Another advice would be to, to go for the MVP. I'm sure everybody does that, but MVP should not be 100% of the customer budget. Uh, an advice would be to split the budget and maybe only have 80% of the budget for an MVP and be sure that you will have some more budget for second phase or third phase and that will help. Finally, uh, you should have some testing strategy and quality assurance manager. We still don't have that uh, internally, the, the quality assurance manager, but I think it's a, it's a must to, uh, to, to optimize the, the last 20%. So from the survey, it's an interesting remarks that says, okay, we also use tools for prototyping. This, they are very nice, but they also hide the complexity of what you're doing and from the lower layers. And so people tend to simplify, and so that, that's very easy, and you should try to explain to the customer where the complexity lies. Another interesting remark is that, okay, it is just normal that we spend so much time and resources to perform the last 20%, but it's just perception that it's an overrun. In the end, it isn't. And a quote from someone that I really liked and wanted to share, the, the devil is in the details. Okay, the last one, never ending sprints. So I don't know about you, but sometimes it comes difficult to, to finish the, the early sprints for many good reasons. It can be lack of resources, lack of people, dependencies with other sprints, or uh, your customer is not ready with the content or they cannot validate it. And so this just jeopardizes the the next sprints and the, uh, the end of the project. So if you have any idea on how you can help with that and just use the app and put your comments and we'll discuss that in a minute. What I would say is maybe discope some of the features from the sprint if you cannot do it. 
Of course, the definition of the print beforehand is very important. Try to avoid dependencies with things that are not ready or won't be ready in the sprint. And the last one is really to avoid testing too early. If it's not finished, if the quality is not there, don't try to spend time for testing because you will pay it in the end and, and you will lose too much time and too, too much budget. Okay, last one from the survey. We asked the different companies how much uh, percentage of, of the rules they, they allocate to the different uh, jobs. And you can see the result here, so 70% on the average for the project management. Analysis a bit more than 10%. And they have quality assurance 6% and testing 7%. So I would like to, to thank already the, the different people who have answered the, the survey. Some of the logos are there, and also the people who didn't want to have the logo on the slide. I would like to thank my colleague Geoffrey for the support with the slides, and the project managers for the discussion and the inspiration about this talk. So that's it. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> so if you have questions, you can come to the mic or raise your hand. Um, I'm also available uh, tomorrow during the contribution or after this session if you want to, to discuss it further. Don't forget to fill in the survey, of course. So. A question? Anybody? Yeah. Thank you for presentation. Uh, just about the last slide, the question you uh, combine together the front end and back end dev uh, time. Like, uh, it would be nice if you split to see how close each of them. Okay. Just, uh, just, just okay. Okay. Do, do you have this information? It would be nice no. if you can share. <laughs> I don't have it, but uh, next time we'll split it. <laughs> Thank you. Don't be shy. <laughs> uh, do you work mostly with uh, time and material or fixed cost projects? Mostly time and material. And all these topics are related as well? Like, Or what are the expectations in the beginning of, uh, of the customer in terms of time and materials? Do yes. they have this uh, limitation of the budget in mind or you go as, as you go and see what exactly is uh, deployed and how it should be changed? No, it's very difficult, I think. They have the global budget in mind, and so they don't really look up at the different phases. And you know, so that's important to, to explain to the customer the rules of the game from the beginning. And uh, I think if you see that they want to spend too much time into the details and you don't have the global objective in mind, it's your role, it's your duty to inform the customer and to tell him, look, if you are doing this, we won't be able to do this other task that is maybe more important to your business. Do, do you try to clarify that, like the top limit of the budget that they have? That's the question they don't like to, to answer, of course. So yeah. if you, that's maybe sometimes difficult with the first project and it's come easier with the second or the third project. And so that's why I also encourage you to not put the full budget of the customer in the first project and maybe try to work together, get to know each other, and when you have confidence, it becomes easier, I have the impression. Thank you. So one of the things I struggle with is convincing customers that it's important to pay um, money for project management or Scrum Master. How do you, what has been your observation and how do you deal with that? Well, I think we have the same observation. When we send our timesheets, and they always look at the, the time or the ratio of the project management against the development. And yes, we meet the same uh, difficulties, but uh, we try to insist. Also, what kind of mistakes that we did was to timesheet um, project management and testing under the same umbrella because they were this was done by the same people. So we tried to split that and to be really clear on what time is spent on functional analysis, what time is spent on project management, on testing, so they understand a bit better why it takes so much time.
Okay, thank you everyone.